So yesterday, um, I talked a bit about how karma and trauma shapes the way we see the world, and it shapes the way uh, we react to when we are triggered. So both uh, the pattern of reaction and how we project, what meaning we give, and um, karma and trauma is frozen in time. So we find ourselves in a recurring cycle of experiencing the same and reacting the same. And that circle is sometimes intensifying. So in the Buddhist cosmology, we learn that that intensifying of seeing things in the old way and responding to that in the old way intensifies and we find ourselves in the so-called lower realms. So then I talked a, bit, a little bit about how to uh, break through that cycle. And um, one thing uh, I started with also yesterday, and I want to start uh, with that uh, today, is learning to create a safe space through an entry protocol in our practice. And that can be different things. I will uh, go to the Tibetan Buddhist tradition because that's where I'm trained. Uh, so in the meditation now, I will invite you to explore how you for yourself can create a safe space, a space where you feel held, where you feel safe, where you feel you can be yourself, and where you have the courage to turn to your experience as it is. Because kind of the main, I mean, it's much more complex than that, but uh, I, I always simplify things too much, but the main ingredients of healing trauma or purifying karma is your willingness to be with your pain, to feel the wound. Yeah. So that's, of course, terrifying because we are one of our basic instinct is to avoid pain. So it's counter instinctual, this move to, to go into the body and feel how you feel. There's a big part of you not wanting to do that. But if we realize what I want to heal, I need to feel, or the only way out is uh, the only way out is through, and you have that recognition that uh, escaping doesn't work because we have done that since beginning this time, and you find yourself, you find in yourself the willingness to experience everything, then uh, you need to be in a safe place. You can't do it alone. Well, that's not a good idea. Of course, some of the healing work we can do alone, but um, so we create, a, we create a safe space. So in the, in the Tibetan Buddhist tradition, part of that is the posture, the earth, you know, learning to ground yourself, coming to the present moment, yeah? what is here in this moment, then the support of the Sangha, yeah? the co-regulation uh, when you meditate with others, we create a field of Maitri, of loving kindness together, where we feel welcomed and where we don't feel alone because we realize, we feel, that we are all human beings with feelings and we all struggle. We also have Buddha nature. Yeah, so both. There's a Buddha within, uh, but there's also the wounded humanness in all of us. And then, and that's maybe particularly strong in the Tibetan tradition, we call upon 
our mentors. We call upon uh, our protective angels, whatever works for you. So that can be the Tibetan tradition that would be maybe a, 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 a heart teacher. It could be a tantric angel like Tara or Shinrizik. It could be Jesus. So, and when we call upon these angels, there is a bit of an experience as if we are relating to something else outside of us. But on a more profound level, these uh, symbols, they are a reflection of our innocence, of our inner light, of essence love, of our true nature. So we connect with something which is inside of us uh, through a projection, kind of keeping the awareness that we are not worshiping and calling upon a being from outside. Yeah, it's kind of part of the practice. It's a bit of a like we 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 keep that a, a, a bit, but at the same time, when we look at the guru, when we look at the ta at Tara, when we look at Jesus, we are aware what we see there is also a projection. Yeah. So the outer symbol reflects something back with what is within us. And we, um, we create a sense of safety. Okay, so let's play with that. So you take your seat. Also the seat, uh, so some of you are probably familiar with, uh, 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 with a meditation posture, uh, that seat. Actually, entails the promise of uh, meeting yourself, being here, being with whatever arises for you, just like the Buddha did uh, under the Bodhi tree, uh, sitting down with the promise, I'm not going to move. And then Mara appears, yeah? And, uh, but he stayed. So that's the promise, one of the promise in the posture. You, you take your 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 you take you take your body seat and fortunately uh, your seat right now is at home which is wonderful because that's the place where we will wake up yeah in our relationships and in our life as it is So you take your time to adjust the posture, particularly if you tend to sit a bit rigid. So then you soften a bit. So there is a healthy mixture of dignity and gentleness and kindness in the posture. And you take your time. So it's not, we don't rush. It's like just sliding. into present moment awareness. And at one point, your eyes might want to close. If you prefer to sit with open eyes, with a, which is perfectly fine, your gaze is relaxed without particular looking at something. And we experience a shift from the head into the body from the thinking mind into present moment awareness. And it might feel like dropping or sliding. You will notice the earth or the chair carrying you. And you let yourself be carried. 
So there's a bit of letting go of the effort and the need to do something. And maybe your breath wants to deepen a little. And with the in-breaths dropping or sliding. And with the out-breath, maybe a bit of softening in the belly and in the shoulders. Welcoming the guests in the guest house of the body. And thoughts continue to arise. The radio station of the narrative self. Uh, but we are not listening so much, kind of lovingly ignoring. And instead we give us the gift of feeling, feeling the inner weather as it is. The breath is a bit of an anchor, but this is not a concentration meditation. It's shifting gear from the doing, from the Controlling from the fixing, interfering to being aware, recognizing what is without doing anything. So we become more aware of the spacious aliveness in our body. Of the pleasant and unpleasant aspects of it. And returning. Resting. And there's a recognition and a Awareness that whatever you experience right now is an appearance within consciousness, within awareness, within mind. The sensations, the core sensations of your posture, the subtle sensation of your emotional body. There's the breath coming and going. There's the sounds around you. And we are softening and opening to what is. Embracing with awareness and breath.
Past exists only in thoughts, future exists only in thoughts. And what is here? When you don't rely so much on labels and projections and words, but on direct experience. So now I invite you more consciously to step into the space of our meeting, into the Sangha, as if we are stepping into a temple or a meditation room. And although physically we are thousands of kilometers apart, energetically we can be together right now. And we can experience a sense of closeness, a sense of brother and sisterhood, because we are human beings with feelings. And we all struggle, meaning that we are on the path of healing trauma and purifying karma for the benefit of all. And if you welcome yourself, you welcome the human experience as it is unfolding within you, that invitation is automatically extended to the others. We are here as human beings with feelings to support each other. Nobody is alone. We are breathing together. And we are here to find healing for ourselves. and then bring that into the world. How fortunate it is to be part of a group like that. So and notice my words, my invitations, how does that feel for you? And then we call upon our mentors, teachers, male and female, Buddhist or non-Buddhist, and we call upon our angels from whatever tradition you feel connected with. 
maybe the founders or if you're connected with practices like Tara, Shinrizik, and so on, Jesus. Maybe you have connection with, with, with Krishna or Ganesha, Christian saints. And if not, then call upon people who really helped you. Yoga teachers, therapists, friends. So you stay within the felt sense of your body. And you feel the presence. You hear them. Maybe there's even a scent, a smell. Maybe there's a touch on your shoulders or a holding of your hand. Imagine how it is to hold the hand of His Holiness the Dalai Lama. You feel the vitality and the love. You look into their eyes. And you call upon these symbols. <clears throat> these connections uh, for yourself, but for every one of us. You explore how it feels to be really welcomed as you are. You don't need to hide. You don't need to carry your persona. Just being yourself. And being held. Being loved. This is like bathing in the morning sun with your whole body from the toes to the top of your head. All around you, also from the back. And uh, don't force yourself to feel something you don't feel. So it's completely effortless. You allow that which is arising to arise. You stay loyal to your experience as it is. the space within which your experiences arises in the felt sense of your body. It's in the nature of love. Nothing is like excluded. And again, you are aware that whatever you experience is an appearance within consciousness, within awareness. 
It's like a dream. So you start to notice that the whole experience is non-static, vibrant, flowing, changing, vividly appearing, but somehow insubstantial. Opening touching gently and holding softly whatever arises, you know, particularly if there's something unpleasant, tight, or numb, tired. Breathing with that and not doing anything. Sometimes maybe returning to a symbol of love, a person, a connection. Relaxing into present moment awareness. Breathing together, being here together. And sometimes it happens that something is opening up. There's a bit of relief. And you can fall deeper. Your experience might become more spacious. But that is something which happens. It's not something you do. Or softening the resistance, the grasping. and returning. Resting. And then our angels, our mentors, they dissolve. And their qualities, particular kindness and care, love, 
streaming into your body, into every cell of your body. And you become aware of the Buddha within, awake awareness within, essence love within, the inner light. That part of you which was never wounded. Maybe you can lightly focus on the heart area, the heart chakra. Opening like a flower in the morning sun. And then loving kindness, care, which you had project projected onto other people, starts to radiate out from in the inside, from your essence. from the Tara within, the goddess within. And it fills your body. And then through the pores of your body, it radiates out. First here in this group, from heart to heart, from light to light. And for a few moments, meditate for the others. Let's liberate each other. And of course, you might still feel contraction somewhere in your body. So the light within starts there and then goes out. And you rest experiencing yourself as a source of kindness, of healing. And then we fill up the spaces around you. In a way, we are all there with you in your room where you're physically. And then you go into the surroundings, into your relationships.
And then you take your time to open your eyes in case they are closed without a sense that the meditation is finished. Or you stay within the felt sense of your body. experiencing the room you are in as a temple. And remaining in the sense of togetherness. So you can uh, raise your hand if you have a question or write in the chat. Yeah, but I also will leave uh, some time towards the end. And what I would like to say something about or explore is um, what is sometimes called spiritual bypassing. Probably uh, you have heard that. I just uh, want to give some examples of that, and feel into that and give you the opportunity maybe to recognize some of these patterns. So we are talking about habits we have uh, to avoid pain. That's a very basic instinct we have. And as I said, the way to heal karma is to turn towards the pain. The way to purify, uh, to, to heal trauma or to heal to, to purify karma is to turn towards that we that which we usually avoid. And since we have such a strong habit of avoiding pain, we use anything. So there is a strong tendency in us and we all do it. It's not a question if we do it because it's so instinctual. It's more a question of when and how, so we become aware and we can turn around. So we have this tendency to want to go into transcending before facing the human experience. So it's like a tendency of wanting to wake up, 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 up. Transcending without including. So that's why I said yesterday, maybe sometimes it's good not to use the word waking up, but waking down. So it's both, yeah, waking down, waking up, and then waking out.
So one thing it's good, to, one thing here good to recognize is it takes a lot of energy to keep that which is wounded in you hidden. It takes a lot, any kind of resistance, any kind of suppressing, any kind of denying takes a lot of energy. Karma and trauma is dormant, so it doesn't disappear by itself. It doesn't disappear through looking into another direction. It stays. It stays stored in the body. And I think somehow, even if we are not uh, going into the arguments why, I think probably like we all have understood uh, and feel that it is never a good idea to suppress feelings. And they, they, we could find a lot of reasons why that is. Like we could explain it more psychologically, but I think we all have that intuition. It's not a good, a good idea to suppress feelings. Uh, but it seems that some parts of the teachings within Buddhism, they tell us that there's something wrong with feelings. You know, they even have horrible words like mental poison or afflictions. Uh, so there seems to be uh, there seems to be a, a teaching out there uh, which advises us that there's something wrong with our feelings. And um, that is really a, a harmful teaching coming into a emotion phobic culture. And also coming into a culture where we have a lot of, uh, where we have a lack of being held in our upbringing. So we suffer in different degrees from disturbed attachment. We have experience in our attachment here, not in the in the Buddhist sense, on the like the healthy attachment, the healthy bonding, a healthy being held, uh, feeling safe, and getting our needs as children met. So somehow we come out of a culture where that is rather the normal, yeah? So, and then we hear these teachings uh, about, uh, for example, anger has a quite a bad reputation in some of the Buddhist teachings or desire, yeah? So, um, There is a, a bit of a difference in a more tantric approach where, it's, where it is acknowledged that uh, these uh, feelings that they have also a wisdom aspect uh, and that it is about transformation and not, uh, uh, not getting rid of being a human being with feelings. So how shows this instinct of avoiding pain, which might be supported by the way we listen to some of the teachings? Um, how does that turn up in the life of a practitioner? Yeah. So I give you some example, some examples of that, and then we can pause and maybe you can feel if that is something you can recognize in yourself. So the first example is uh, conflict avoiding in the disguise of easygoing. So easygoing meaning here, you know, I mean, we all would like to be people who are easygoing, 
and we are attracted by people who are easygoing, who are just calm, apparently detached. They are okay with everything. But there is a fake easygoing. It's like cultivating a persona of a practitioner who is easygoing. So the question here is: if we turn, if you if you think of yourself as an easygoing person, to turn your awareness inside and go deeper and feel if there's any resentment there hidden if there's any suppressed needs there hidden in other words if it's not an easy going which is really felt in your body a sense of openness and aliveness and genuine happiness uh, with the situation, or if you're honest, at least with yourself, if there is some resentment going on. And if you're easygoing and not saying anything, is actually you being afraid of conflicts and you not being loyal to your own needs because that is something you have learned as a survival strategy in your childhood. It was a good idea back then to be to not express your needs, to be there for others to take care of others. The little girl, the little child needed to do that in order to survive in that family system. So, and then of course we get into, uh, in, into a teachings where we hear about this ideal of the easygoing person, happy with everything, not needing anything, uh, not being aggressive. So we, we have this ideal, we see that ideal. And then of course something in us says, wow, that's great. That's wonderful. I can do that. So we build up a, a persona and um, you can you can find uh, that collectively in, in a lot of the spiritual groups that <clears throat> uh, there's just pretense of uh, fake Buddhist smiles. And behind it is resentment and frustration and also a sense of being really stuck in your practice. You practice for 10, 20 years and inside nothing really changes. You are just getting better to uh, play the game and wear the right clothes and say the right prayer and have a fake behavior of being easygoing. So I mentioned already this uh, denying your needs. Yeah. Just a funny little example uh, came to my mind. Uh, um, uh, many years ago, I I was uh, I was the director of a monastery, 
for Tibetan monks, and uh, we welcomed uh, a Tibetan geisha, a Tibetan teacher, who came just out of his training from the monastery, so he was never in the West before, he didn't know anything how, about how wounded we are, and uh, and uh, and uh, the Tibetans uh, were, at least the ones I lived with, uh, and also this teacher's, this teacher, he didn't express his needs directly, never. So then it comes to this uh, funny situation that uh, you offer him a tea and he drinks the tea and then you ask him, oh, would you like to have another tea? And he says, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm easygoing. I'm not attached. But he actually is expecting that you kind of push the tea into him. Yeah. So my first response as a Westerner is to no, I don't want to have a tea, was okay. <laughs> yeah, so, and, then, and then it took it, it took a few years actually of uh, him learning uh, uh, to communicate with me and he, uh, he learning to say, if I ask him, do you want another cup of tea to say yes? Yeah. So that's, that, and then when we try to uh, adapt that kind of behavior from Tibetan teachers, yeah, being humble, yeah, you know this uh, competition and who is bowing the deepest, yeah, it's all fake. It doesn't it doesn't fit into our culture, and it and we deny uh, what is going on in us and that can be so severe that we might come to a point where we actually don't know anymore what we need that, that, that we need to have time to really explore that question what do i need and of course we we don't always get what we need yeah but um, that's life so we don't always get what we need uh, but to be loyal to our needs and to dare to express them. So we use spiritual practices uh, to avoid how we feel and what is really going on. Another good example is codependency in the disguise of compassion. So we all, particularly in the Mayana tradition, we have this ideal of helping others, serving, being there for others. And then we hear even that we accumulate good karma through that. Yeah? So, so not only we, we, um, we just follow uh, uh, survival strategy we have learned in childhood in a recurring pattern we also feel we get some karma points for for it like some merit points in into our into our account but uh, of course when we look into the teachings on karma then we start to learn what is actually the most important thing in the in the in the how we create karma is through our intention so can you imagine different kinds of intention behind being kind and serving others than a sense of fullness and generosity and connectedness what other kinds of intention could be behind Can you imagine to be kind because you're afraid? Can you imagine to help others because you feel guilty? Can you imagine to be generous because you're ashamed? I guess. I guess we can recognize to different degrees uh, that 
the intention, the motivation behind a so-called compassionate act, which we can discipline ourselves into, can come from a wound, can come from, can come from a wounded place in us. It's part of a recurring pattern of serving, of denying our needs, of needing to be there for others because our childhood needs were not met. Ah, I forgot something very important uh, in the beginning before, before going into this, yeah? Because it's, it's tough to hear that stuff, right? Like, uh, why it is tough? Because we have the tendency to judge the wounded parts in us. We have a tendency to judge when we don't, when we, when we notice, um, yeah, I'm, I'm on the outside, I'm this kind of per, kind person, but inside there's something else going on. And then we have this pattern of judging, not judging our feelings, judging our wounds. So what is very important in this exploration of spiritual bypassing to do it with love, to do it with kindness. It's very important. It's so easy uh, when we increase our awareness of our inner life, how it is real, how how it really is, what's really going on, not what appears on the outside, but what is really going behind the scenes, uh, to do it to to something in you, the inner judge, the inner critic, will use that yeah, to put you down. So we need to be really aware of that and uh, explore our inner life with curiosity and kindness, compassion. And also what is helpful here in, an, in any kind of inner exploration that you don't perceive yourself as a single, single thing, but as a system with many processes going on, with many aspects. You are a family, not just one, one thing. That's very helpful. And it's in accordance with the basic teachings on no self, yeah? no center, no core. Yeah? So you are a process, an open process. And there's a lot of things going on. And what is a, a lot of what is going on in your inner life, a lot of the processes, they are there because something happened to you. It's not your fault. It's not your fault. You didn't choose to grow up in a family where you needed to be the peacemaker. Because it was a good idea to take on that role. Because not doing it was perceived back then when you were four years old as life-threatening. If I'm not the peacemaker, I will be excluded. And exclusion for, uh, for a four-year-old is equals death. Because you, do, can't, you can't take care of yourself. So better become a peace, peacemaker. Better being more interested in other people, how they are doing, rather than how you do. And that, uh, that kind of uh, uh, kindness and compassion towards the wounded parts, the abandoned parts, the parts you, of you you, you wish who, who wouldn't be there and who are frozen in time. Yeah, they are frozen in time. Uh, that also, of course, then is the foundation for genuine compassion and kindness to others because you start to see it also in other people. 
less judgments towards your inner family means automatically less judgment to what's going on in other people. So another uh, area here in what is called spiritual bypassing, so uh, meaning using spiritual practice to avoid wounding, to not do necessary steps in the path of growing up, of becoming a mature person, is um, another area is using meditation to numb or detach. And, you know, of course, it's fine to distract and to numb and to detach, you know, it's, it's not, it's not an evil thing. And we all need to do that to a certain degree. I mean, it's not like, uh, you know, uh, but um, if our main intention or main drive in our meditation practice is not to feel how we feel, then, of course, after 20 years of doing that, we come to a place then where we notice not, not much happened in my inner life. There's still I'm still in the recurring cycle of my reactivity. Still the same depression, still the same fear. Still, it's still the same. Uh, with... Of course, the possibility to, uh, through, like, if you are good in concentration meditation, for example, then you can take a kind of a temporary break. Yeah. But even a simple meditation, like breathing meditation, can be just uh, a way of uh, trying to avoid feelings. And it would be good, it, or jhana practice also. I mean, if you are good in in, in jhana practice, you, know, you can drop into uh, some space, spacious, uh, transcendental space, and that there is even a word like transcendental meditation. <laughs> so like, okay, you go there, and it's possible. It's a room in you. It's a dimension in you, so you can go there. But hanging out there doesn't doesn't uh, doesn't uh, doesn't make you grow, and you can easily check that. You know, that's the experience of you know uh, going to retreat and having some wonderful experiences, and then coming back home, same, 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 same trigger, same reaction. So people get the feeling: what, what, what the heck is going on? There's this division between my retreat time and the rest of my life yeah because in retreat time if you just take a break from who you are in some transcendental dimension jhana or concentration uh, then of course you don't change because what you want to heal you need to feel waking down and waking up, transcend and include. And there's a whole spiritual market about up, 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 up. Yeah, up, up. Another example is boosting up an insecure self with outer signs and initiation. Boosting up an insecure self by being a student of Lama such and such. Boosting up an insecure uh, self by being in the right club. Taking initiations. It's different in different groups, of course. Um, but particularly in Buddhist communities, I, I often 
it's to my surprise, actually, I often see uh, a real resistance to do re emotional work, to really just feel how you feel. You know, it's, it's about the rituals, about the outer, uh, the behavior, but what's going on inside? And that's why the, all these scandals happened recently. It's just the shadow coming out, because at one point the shadow comes out. So another example of this is the idealization of the guru. So if you, uh, if you have a background uh, in your personal psychology, uh, in your personal, in your psychological history of your needs not being met, that part of you will seek that. Yeah. And that part of you is very young. So, and what a better opportunity than an enlightened man to be your super father. And of course, uh, there, is, <clears throat> uh, there is a profound uh, value in the practice of guru devotion, it's different. I'm I don't know which kind of tradition you are based in. Yeah. So, but the the role of the teacher is different in different traditions. And so it is a very precious practice, but it's for Westerners, it's a minefield, and uh, it goes wrong all over the place because we don't have really healthy role models in that. But you can sometimes, you know, when you are in a group where this guru game is very strong, and I don't say it in a, I don't use guru, uh, uh, like with content, you know, because I have played the guru game for 30 years, yeah? Uh, and I managed to uh, benefit from it. But some, in some of the groups, you can you can see when when the guru comes into the room, there's a whole there's a regression, yeah. The whole group regresses and gets like glazed in that kind of I don't know. And then the last thing, maybe, and there's there's more, yeah. So it's just some some things to uh, uh, to uh, to to reflect upon or to to feel into. Um, it could be expressed as using ultimate truth to deny re relative truth. Yeah. So it's like. Oh, it's all empty. It's all awareness. I'm awareness. Um, yeah, I, I, I see some of you not. You can recognize that. <laughs> it's, it's like, you know, I mean, I have meditated a lot in my life, like full time. I, I have been five years in retreat. Yeah, I can meditate everything away. I can deconstruct everything. I can, uh, you know, do uh, really immature things and just meditate my feelings away, my feelings of healthy guilt, my feelings of healthy shame. Yeah, of course, there's toxic guilt and toxic shame. So that's something to look at. But shame and guilt have also have something to tell us. I can meditate this away. So I can always drop beyond or above or, and, uh, and that's not good. So 
I um, I appreciate the last five years, particularly in my life, where I went back into uh, exploring the territory of feelings, of my emotional body, of that which uh, is suppressed in me. Yeah. So is there any comments, questions? I, 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 just one thing. Uh, this, what I kind of, I mean, I just raised a few things actually. So it's very complex, everything. And so it's just more like more questions now. But um, I recorded this weekend, I, uh, I gave last year, I think it's called Trauma and Karma and it's on my SoundCloud profile. So you can listen to that and there's more details there. Um, yeah, just in case you, because otherwise I, I, I would feel bad after this meeting uh, that I didn't really covered what I, what, what one could cover. And then of course, it's another thing then, so how to practice with this, yeah? I mean, I said now, for example, uh, facing and uh, being with your feelings, but how you need to acquire technology on how, how to do that. What does it mean? Yeah. What kind of practices are available? And, um, and also when is the time to seek professional support? Yeah. That's also, I think some of the things we can address within the container of traditional practice by kind of uh, practicing in a different stuff as it would be helpful to uh, turn to other uh, to other methods as well for western based methods. Yeah, is there anything any comment or Uh, there is some. Yeah, it was just a comment. Uh, yes, the, the whole anger thing is, I mean, that's something to, uh, yeah. To, uh, what's healthy aggression? You know? So to explore that. Yeah. Cynthia? Hey, just unmuting. Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, good. Hi, first time, long time no see. Hello, lovely to see you. <laughs> ah, okay, now I know who you are. <laughs> from, from Nalanda, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay, yes, are you in the United you. States? No, I'm in, still in Toulouse. Ah, you're still in Toulouse. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Wow. Still around. Yeah, we'll have a lot of... If you are the here. only one here who knows me as a monk. Uh, perhaps, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but I still have to call you Pende in my head, yep. Um, yeah, yeah, you can. Some people do, is... still do that. So, so I'm, I'm responding to Panda as well. <laughs> okay, amazing, thank you. I just wanted to share two things. One, one uh, I've often observed the things that you're talking about. I've often wondered, it seems to me uh, from a non-professional that there's also a gendered component to it. I've often noticed that the men I see in, I mean, without generalizing too much because yeah. everybody's different, but the men seem to use meditation to avoid their feelings yeah. <laughs> or it's all emptiness or something when, um, when they're being yes. a jerk and that it's, and that the women will tend to run off and do it with the helping and the compassion and the service kind of, yeah. thing. I, I don't know. It's a question to explore, but that's just a, a thing. Yes. And another thing is that um, one of my teachers said something a long time ago, which is that um, Buddhism was for people that were already psychologically healthy. 
when he was just because he knows Westerners very well and he was kind of discussing. I mean, he didn't use the term wounded, like you're saying, but that kind of idea that these techniques and a lot of this stuff are for people who are already healthy and that maybe you have to go fix and heal psychologically, you know, in a Western sense before you, mm. you go on this way. And I hadn't heard a lot of people say that, but I did think it was very, it made sense. Yeah. The, to admit that the, on the, on the yeah. side of a Tibetan Lama, to admit that and to say that, you know, this yeah. stuff is is for a, for a different thing. And I do think they don't say all feelings are bad, right? A lot of feelings are really good, <laughs> but point very yeah. well taken, point very well taken. And it's brilliant. Everything you've said, I'd look forward to the SoundCloud profile. Yeah. Yep. Thanks. That's it. Yes, thank you, Cynthia. It was really nice to reconnect and uh, yeah, the, the, I think with the gender thing, uh, that's interesting, uh, but I, I, I'm, I'm not so sure with Americans how much one can still talk about differences between men and women. So, yeah, but uh, uh, yeah, I can recognize what you say. Yes, something else. There's, uh, yeah. Hey, so so thank you so much. I I've actually listened to you uh, for a couple of years now and really enjoy it. And one of the things uh, that you said of like the only way out is through. Like I've heard you say that before, and it's been really helpful in my practice. And a lot of what you've been saying both both days have really resonated with me as far as this notion of like yeah feeling you know out of the sit feeling very you know sort of warm and open and empty and compassionate and then go into my daily life whether it's with work or with parenting or whatever and something will arise that's just just springs out of me in a way that's totally not <clears throat> warm and loving uh, to whomever I'm interacting with and this notion of like it being very relational. And my first instinct, you know, is to, to, to see that as like an affliction, like, oh, I'm, this is, this is contrary to how I want to be. This is not right. This is an indicator of it, something not working. But I think this notion that you're describing of like, that's a way in to be very warm and very loving to that, that that's this aspect, this, you know, part, this, this, this other member of the family that needs to be sort of heard and cared for. It's sort of hard to do, you know, but it, it's an, it's a, this pointer that you're, you're bringing up as like in those instances that that's not something to condemn, but to, to embrace and mm -hmm. through that, you know, welcoming and, and healing so that there is that, you know, sort of growth. Um, so anyway, I really appreciate that. That was very helpful mm. to me. Yes. Yeah. So we, we uh, in, as I said yesterday, I think also what we become curious about and what we find precious is what? That's the invitation is, the moments when we are activated, the moments when we are triggered. Not to see them as obstacles or as failing, but actually as opportunity, because whenever we are triggered by our partner, by our kids, uh, it is shown to us where, where, we, are still, where we are still stuck. And then... Um, acquiring the capacity to stay with that being triggered in the felt sense of our body and resisting, starting to resist the push of the conditioned pattern of reactivity. I don't know if that's clear, but that's um, so not suppressing, you know. So it's not suppressing the the pattern, but uh, not 
not going down that road. And so, and with and replacing resistance and judgment with kindness. And I found it helpful in my own practice to work with systems like internal family systems therapy or a voice dialogue, or if you want to be more in the traditional domain, feeding the demon yeah, by Lama Tsultra Malione. So all this, uh, all this work where we uh, start a different kind of relationships with the abandoned parts in us and with the survival patterns we have developed to, to start to cultivate a non-judgmental, loving, curious even, because the abandoned parts and the hurt parts and these patterns, they have also something to say. They, have, they, they can contribute to something, uh, with something. They are part of the team. You need to wake up together. You can, I mean, we wake up together with all these parts. Yeah? And they all have something to give. They all have something to contribute. And vitality is locked in them. I mean, the, the, the survival strategies, they are so energetic. Um, so, and this vitality in them, we want to unpack and benefit from it. It's possible, definitely. I, I see it in myself and in others. It's possible to be to be really kind to all this, but it needs some work and it needs support and technology. So you need to learn some practices, some techniques, and it needs this promise to turn towards what is painful. And, it's, and again, we need to be kind. So it's completely fine to distract yourself. That's part of the coping strategy. It's fine to not stare at the pain all the time, yeah? I mean that could be also like a, you know, like you know, some people are too attached to pain, and they 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 don't give them the opportunity to look at that which is fine, which is beautiful, which feels good. Yeah. So it's also about learning to learning to use pleasure, having fun. That's important. Yeah, maybe we finish with a little quiet sitting uh, and... Uh... Sunday, excuse yeah. me. Yes. Um, Cynthia wrote a really good question in the chat okay. and I was hoping that you would address it because I thought it was an yeah. excellent question that a lot of people can relate to. If we can just go over a couple of minutes. How, but not to react, how do you do that if it feels the pain and trauma will be overwhelming? Yeah, uh, so that has to do with, um, you know, the, yeah, so that's, what we don't want to uh, experience is uh, re-traumatizing and overwhelm. So that's why it's uh, so important to establish a strong entry protocol for this work, whatever, you know, so, and that could be maybe uh, a long time. Like if you work with a trauma, a trauma therapist, it may, it, it may take some months of just uh, cultivating a connection where you feel safe, where you feel held, where you be your, you, where you feel, where yeah, where so. So 
posture and so on. So being in the Sangha, calling Tara, so you are not alone, and um, using uh, co regulation, M making the space in which the difficult feeling can be bigger through another person. And if it's not too bad, that other person can be Tara, yeah? Um, but uh, probably it can be also a friend. Ideally, it could be the Sangha, but I haven't found that Sangha yet. <laughs> Yeah, so <laughs> and, and I've been moving around in a lot of sanghas. Yeah, uh, the closest I got to was uh, Gamp Gampu Abbey in in uh, in Nova Scotia. You know, I, I attended like a three months winter retreat with Pema Shetra, and so I mean that was like there was space for that. That yeah, for the mess. Yeah. So, but other sanghas, maybe not so much. Yeah, co-regulation, I think. That's that's probably like the quickest answer to that question. When the pain and the trauma is overwhelming, to co-regulate. Okay, so let's take uh, just a few minutes to sit in the glow of our meeting. So take a few moments to shift a bit again into the felt sense of your body and just notice how it feels now for you to be here in the physical surroundings where you are, but at the same time in our meditation room here. Emphasizing the felt sense, the aliveness in your body, instead of the thoughts. How's your belly? Just a moment of resting. Possibly with a sense of appreciation or gratitude that we are here protected by the teachings of the Buddha. And how fortunate it is to have a North Star, a refuge, a safe direction. So even if we start to see and acknowledge how traditional teachings uh, can be I wouldn't say harmful, but um, at least the way we understand them and we re the way we practice them, there's traps, but seeing the traps helps us to avoid them, instill the Dharma, Buddha Dharma Sangha is the medicine, and we are so fortunate to be on the path. Together with others. And 
And then from this moment, radiating out, the goodness where you live. and then into the world. Okay, thank you so much. I'm really happy about uh, our meeting and um, happy to get to know some new people, see new faces. And yeah, maybe I see you again at one point. Uh, I would like to do some more teachings in the Dharma Collective. Um, I'm also teaching in the Shanti Deva Center in New York, so you can check that out. It's once a month, also a weekend. So take care. Thank you. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you so much. Bye. Thanks. Thank Bye. you. Bye.